Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We're headed into our final segment of the day, and I wanted to touch on the 2024 WNBA draft, which took place on Monday night. I haven't had a chance to react to it just yet. So here we are now. The draft became the most viewed WNBA draft in history. It had never surpassed 1 million viewers in the past. And they not only hit 1 million, but they hit 2.4 million viewers on Monday night, which is another big time step after the historic viewership numbers during the women's NCAA tournament. Caitlin Clark, no surprise, of course, was selected number one overall. Now officially a member of the Indiana Fever. Some of the other biggest college stars and their landing spots here. Cameron Brink was taken by the LA Sparks with the second overall pick. She's going to be joined by another top four pick in Rakia Jackson from Tennessee, who LA took with that fourth overall pick. We have another team up situation as well in Chicago as Camilla Cardoso of South Carolina is going to be teaming up with Angel Reese of LSU who were both selected in the top 10 by the Chicago Sky. Like Cardoso said after the draft, nobody is getting rebounds on them. A little bit of a twin tower situation Possibly Cardoso averaged 10 rebounds per game last season. Reese averaged 13. Obviously different teams, but still a very fun pairing there. UConn's Aaliyah Edwards was taken with the 6th overall pick by the Washington Mystics. And Kate Martin, Caitlin Clark's teammate at Iowa, who supposedly went to the draft just to support Caitlin Clark, did see her name get called in the second round by the reigning champion Las Vegas Aces. A lot of people, by the way, not that I'm an expert necessarily on all of this, not my expertise at least, uh, a lot of people really loving how the Aces handled their draft as they're looking for a three-peat this year. But on the note of the viewership numbers, and the potential of the league's growth in popularity. These next couple years, I do think, are going to be pretty much make or break for if this league is going to at least show signs of being profitable, where there is tons of momentum in the women's basketball sport coming off of this record-breaking women's tournament. They have a star-studded rookie class with a lot of these big-time names that the league has really never fully seen before. Now, listen, I understand plenty of legends that have come out of the college game and into the professional leagues, but in terms of you know household name recognition, I don't think that there has been this level and this... Uh, of both, you know, how powerful these names are and the number, the quantity of a lot of these big time names. So should be a lot of fun to see there. But there is this conversation that has sort of broke out surrounding the WNBA and the fact that Caitlin Clark's contract is going viral after being the number one overall pick. She got a four-year deal worth $338,000, which frankly is not very much for, of course, being a number one overall selection, but her contract is going to be something along the lines of in the 60000 mark for the first couple years. Finally, it's going to reach ninety by her fourth season, which is actually an option, but many people are pointing to Victor Wembanyama's contract, who was the of course, the most recent number one overall pick in the NBA. His deal is going to be worth $55 million over four years. And a lot of people are talking about how outrageous and how unfair this is. Even President Joe Biden sort of chimed in on the conversation saying this is an example of how women need to be paid more fairly. I really don't think that this is a woman's rights issue I think it's more about basic economics and the current state surrounding the women's college basketball game. And, you know, we are 
totally pro women's sports in this situation and we do want to uplift them but there is also just a little bit of a reality here that the WNBA has never turned a profit the NBA has basically been funding the league's existence over the past handful of years and you can argue that some of the reasons surrounding the popularity of the league is the fact that the same resources haven't been poured into women's basketball quite as much but I think the reality is there just hasn't been the same level of stardom that was necessary to really uplift an up-and-coming sport this happened with every single league that existed the sort of exponential growth that we saw it was a case it was the case with the NBA during the 1950s even the NFL had took a very long time to surpass the college football world and now it seems like with all of these names coming into the league people are actually going to care more and I do agree that the that the the marketing surrounding the women's game now is at an all-time high and that absolutely helps but even still i think that you know marketing can only take you so far and not as many people cared about the women's game up until these recent years i think that's going to change and we can root for the game to grow while also acknowledging the other factors as to why someone with the stature of Caitlin Clark is going to be making as little money as she is through her first contract and a lot of people are pointing to the fact that she got this I think it was three million dollar offer from the big three to actually go and play with them instead and I do think that Caitlin Clark also is going to be making up a lot of this money in endorsements, which is, you know, obviously going to help her financial situation. But, and, and I don't think she's going to be, you know, living that penny to penny lifestyle because of that. But I think that it is very big of her to understand this that she holds a role she talked about this with her legacy ahead of the national championship game it's not necessarily about scoring x amount of points or x amount of wins it's about uplifting the game as a whole what she leaves behind especially for the next generations and she has the potential to be and along with you know her skill as a whole as a and on one hand anyways is something to be debated about how great is she going to be in the league but the level of you know superstardom the marketability of her all of that plays into this in a massive way that i think she is going to help grow the sport and the league has clearly sort of mimicked that thought as well with the fact that I saw a stat from sports center that 90 percent of fever games are going to be nationally televised this season as things currently stand this is a fever team that was 13 and 27 last year was at the bottom of the standings and now there is you know this situation where caitlin clark in the eyes of espn is must see tv and specifically with that as well, she's not just, you know, a fan favorite and is somebody that the people want to watch the national, you know, viewers, but also the fact that the WNBA needs to capitalize on this type of momentum. And hopefully that momentum builds over the next few years to the point where by the time that Clark and her, the remainder of her rookie class are getting these big time contracts when they become free agents in a few years and it thinks that this is the current situation but you know the reality is for everybody who is calling for the these players to be getting paid more where is the money coming from because the WNBA just can't afford it and the NBA is already pouring tons of money into I don't want to call it a project. It's a league that I think will be able to stand on its own sooner rather than later. But 
I don't really know what your solution would be as to how can these players make more money today. But, you know, sort of on that note as well, there is the fact that there are some stories coming out about the idea that Caitlin Clark's first ever WNBA game is going to be May 14th, which also is going to line up sort of around the schedule of the NHL playoffs. And we saw call it women's basketball sort of rival NHL numbers this season. Listen, I myself am not the number one NHL fan in the world. I you know, follow it, of course, um, specifically the Bruins, but in general, I do watch the NHL, but the popularity levels of it aren't necessarily um, massive, and the women's basketball game is sort of catching up to it, so there's this idea that there may be a little bit of a conflict between Caitlin Clark's debut and how that plays into the NHL playoffs, she currently is slated to be playing on ESPN2, but that could be the same day of some NHL playoffs, which ESPN has a bunch of those games, of course, so going to be interesting to see how that plays out as well. But let me know what you think about the situation surrounding the WNBA, about Caitlin Clark, about the contract situation all of that. We're going to be wrapping up the show, but first I want to address some comments in the section here from Kirito MVP 11 uh, talking about Clay Thompson. He was offered a six year, $278 million deal by the magic and the, the, that the magic supposedly according to Kirito gave him um, some extra incentives that go beyond just the paycheck themselves. Should Clay Thompson take that deal or should he be loyal to the Golden State Warriors? You know, for Clay at this point, I think it's hard to turn down a massive deal such as that. I, I don't know if I'm the magic if I'm offering up that type of deal, although I do think that they are in position to potentially go out and spend this off season. They have this up and coming core. They ended up as the five seed in the playoffs this year. They were in contention for the two seed heading into the final weeks. And they have, you know, some real franchise cornerstones, specifically Paolo Bancaro being the monster that he is being selected to his first ever all-star appearance this year in just his second season. So, Again, from a Magic perspective, I probably wouldn't hand out that deal. But for Clay Thompson, you know, it's really about what is his priority at this point in his career. Because if he still wants to go out and make significant money, that's a no-brainer. He's not going to get that type of a deal anywhere else at this point. You know, I still don't think that Clay is necessarily a zero in the NBA, even though last night was absolutely brutal for him. He can still play, but I don't think that the Warriors, especially for how expensive they currently are, and they're going to be able to offload that Chris Paul $30 million that they owe him, but it's still not going to fully absolve them of the financial situation they're in. I feel like it's really hard to justify giving Klay Thompson really more than $15 million a year, and... I, I don't really know what the consensus is on what number people are looking to hand out to Clay Thompson. Maybe it's disrespectful me saying $15 million, but I look at a deal like Kobe White, who is making $12 million, and that is a reliable, you know, can start everyday point guard, can be a big time six man of the year candidate if that is the direction that either Chicago or whatever team that has him in the future can operate with. And that's a bargain of a deal. But that's the thing. I would pay Kobe White that money over Clay Thompson 10 times out of 10. And maybe that's a crazy take on my end. Again, I don't want to totally bury Clay Thompson, but I just don't think that he's that level of contributor. Um, you know, the offense is great when it's great, but he still doesn't have that defensive prowess that made him such a special player for all those years. And 
I have a really hard time justifying the Warriors with the situation that they're currently in because they're playing, they're paying Andrew Wiggins as much money as they are and Draymond Green as well, that they're going to have to cut back in certain areas. And I don't think you can overpay for Klay Thompson out of a loyalty factor. I know your question was about should Klay Thompson be the one that's loyal. I think both parties are going to have to reflect on what sort of got them to this place and clay deserves you know all the love in the world from warriors fans for everything he's done over the past couple years but you know past again i keep saying couple years a decade really is how long he's been a crucial contributor for them but i feel like the warriors definitely have a little bit more of a you know designated time slot here in the final years with curry they have to take advantage and this is you know the last real chance that clay thompson has to potentially the the last chance he has to cash out we'll see what what the market looks like for him and then Carito also mentioned a rumor about the hornets putting in a trade offer for steph curry that is something that of course Curry grew up in Charlotte a lot when Del Curry, his father, played for the Charlotte Hornets. And that's something that's always sort of, you know, been talked about a bit is what if Steph went back to his hometown. And the reality is, you know, it would be a fun story, but that would be a waste of the final years of the best version of Curry. Now, I'm not saying I would hate to see it necessarily. I feel like the Eastern Conference isn't the same level of difficulty as the West, but you know, I think it would be a very iffy fit too. Not that I mean you take Steph Curry over LaMelo Ball ten times out of ten, and if a trade were to be made, LaMelo would probably be a part of that. But what are the other pieces going around Steph Curry that make that worth it for the Hornets either? Where I love Brandon Miller. He would be, you know, just about untradeable, um, specifically in the Steph Curry talks. But there's really not too much else surrounding that Charlotte team that would be super encouraging in terms of why the Hornets could do that. And if you're the Warriors, I mean, you probably want to hold on to Curry as long as possible and... Um, I wouldn't even say go into a real rebuild. I think if you're the Warriors, you shouldn't be looking to rebuild. But, you know, to your question, if the Warriors say they uh, want to go into a rebuild, I mean, I hate to say this. I, I really do because this would be, as a Celtics fan, a worst nightmare. But I don't know. And they, they really don't. I mean, what teams do have the assets to go out and get Curry? But I'm thinking like uh, Philadelphia or a Miami. Like those are teams that, again, I don't, the value it's going to take for trading for Steph Curry is really off the charts. Um, but I mean, who knows? There's also a situation where in Cleveland where Donovan Mitchell, there's been so much buzz over the past couple years that Mitchell is going to want out of Cleveland. Now is Golden State going to sort of gamble on the idea of, can we get Donovan Mitchell to sign in the long term? And Mitchell's of course, you know, in his prime now. So it maybe doesn't make sense as a true building block, but also if they could get some long-term co commitment from Donovan Mitchell, they get another piece in there as well then that would be interesting. I believe Steph was born in Akron, if I'm not mistaken. So not necessarily the growing up in that area uh, like Charlotte, but a little bit of a storyline there going back to Ohio where he was born could be interesting there. I mean, all the options here, I think the most likely situation is the Warriors are going to try and maximize their opportunities here in these final few seasons for, you know, surrounding Curry with an actual championship contending roster, or at least try to is the thing. I don't know if they can fully get there. Their young pieces are some massive chips for them in terms of trying to make some moves the way that Pajemski and Trace Jackson Davis from this past year have been 
late season or late draft picks, I should say, that have emerged the way that they have. Moses Moody, I'm still a believer in that he can be an effective piece on a team. If I'm another team, I would definitely be willing to potentially take some sort of a flyer. And I'm a team that's looking to rebuild. I would like Moody. Obviously, you probably want the Kaminga or the probably you probably want Pajemski over him as well. Um, the fact that I hesitated even that long was probably disrespectful to Pajemski, but I'm just a Moses Moody fan. But Again, you know, these are sort of the different decisions the Warriors are going to have to go with. And we know how good of a drafting organization this has been over the past decade or so, which was even further shown in this past year's draft. Do they want to give up draft capital to try and maximize their situation now? I think probably we saw them try and run with the two timelines at once and it really just never panned out for them. Um, one thing that I saw on social media earlier and it does really just sort of make you think is the fact that the Warriors were, you know, just a couple lottery balls away from having that number one overall pick in 2020 and getting Anthony, da Anthony Edwards instead of... James Wiseman, I mean, talk about night and day difference and the Warriors would be, you know, in a perfect situation going forward if that were the case. Just something that's sort of funny to reflect on. But I don't know. Let me know what you think about what the Warriors should do long term as well. That is all the time we have for today. But thank you very much for tuning in to the GSMC Sports Podcast. Thank you to the GSMC Sports Network for allowing us to host this show. Be sure to check us out on socials and keep up with the other great shows that we host here. Um, let, just a reminder to like, follow, subscribe, and we will be back tomorrow afternoon, same time, 2 o'clock Eastern, to reflect on the play-in tournament games from tonight in the Eastern Conference, as well as all the other latest happenings in the sports world so we will see you then let's go i wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow feel like it's gonna be a bad day yeah, i'm tired of shit and the coffee ain't hit yet damn ain't that great i don't want to go